nice to see you. Good that you managed to come to your last lecture on Saturday. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> so let us recall what we discussed last time, which was actually yesterday. So what was our topic of discussion? Uh, uniform curricular mode. And what makes this uniform curricular mode actually? Why it's uniform? Constant velocity, but we have constant velocity in um, magnitude, but it changes in direction since this object is moving around circular trajectory. So that should be highlighted because this change in um, direction of velocity vector is um, the origin for so called centripetal acceleration, uh, originated <clears throat> from change of this velocity and is. Uh, pointed towards the center of the uh, circular trajectory. Uh, we calculated the in two different ways the uh, uh, orientation of this centripetal acceleration vector and its magnitude. So first we considered some graphical representation with two similar angulars based on uh, radius vectors uh, and uh, uh, velocity vectors. And uh, also, uh, we afterwards we introduce two parameters, which are um, period of circular motion and angular velocity. And by the way, what is the units for uh, angular velocity per second? Yes. So we have two pi radian is equal to three hundred sixty degrees. So it means we have whole circle. And uh, uh, with that, we could express analytically the expression for um, time-dependent radius vector for uniform circular motion. And uh, by taking two derivatives over time of this time-dependent radius vector, we could um, de uh, derive the equation for uh, acceleration, centripetal acceleration vector which uh, was, uh, as you may recall, uh, equal to minus omega times uh, omega square times uh, r uh, vector, which is uh, radius vector. So we have angular uh, centripetal acceleration vector um, pointed uh, parallel to the position vector or radius vector, but to the towards the center of the trajectory, so in, in opposite direction to the uh, radius vector. So now with this, we kind of covered all major topics of kinematics. My congratulations, you already should be experts in kinematics, should know where objects are going to be in any moment of time. And our next step is dynamics. We start dynamics with three laws of motion. Uh, so our previous question in the scope of kinematics was to answer the question, uh, like to, to know the information about position of object in any moment of time. However, uh, for um, dynamics, we want to know also the reason of this um, motion. And uh, um, that will be our point of interest in the scope of dynamics. So let us introduce um, first law of motion or so-called first Newton's law. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it actually tells us that in an inertial system of reference, uh, means that this system of reference doesn't move with any acceleration with respect to others, the inertial system of reference. Uh, <clears throat> An object which we may call free or quasi free, I will give definition of this, will either be stationary or will move with constant velocity along a straight line. So let us explain certain things here. So, what is a free object? Any suggestions? There are no forces going from the external. Yeah, there are no external forces exerted on this object. And uh, in that case, we can call it free. 
there is another, but that is quite a unique situation that uh, really <coughs> idealistic picture because uh, it's uh, almost impossible to realize. You need to go somewhere in outer space. Uh, so for ideal condition, yes, it may be the case, but um, realistically, we deal more with quasi-free objects. So quasi-free object is, uh, it, there may be many forces exerted on this object, but the key requirement is that these uh, forces cancel each other. So it means that the uh, vector sum of all forces, which are vector quantities, exerted on this body uh, will be equal to zero. So we can probably even write it down here to highlight the quasi-free quasi object will be when we have sum of all exerted forces, vector sum uh, equal to zero. So in that case, if we have either free or quasi-free object, it will, and should, it doesn't have other options according to this first law of motion. By the way, this laws of motions they are not derived from anything it's just empirical observations uh, so how it actually works and observed in nature so based on this uh, people made a conclusion they summarize this in three laws of motion um, so um, it either stays stationary or moves with constant velocity vector and in this case we need to highlight that constant velocity vector in this case is not only magnitude as we had for uniform circular motion, but also in direction. So it means it moves with constant velocity along a straight line. So if it starts to change its velocity vector orientation, then we know already the change of orientation of velocity vector causes uh, this um, um, centripetal acceleration, and that will be already not inertial system of reference. We uh, don't have this option. So either object is stationary or moves with constant velocity along a straight line. So that's definition of uh, first law of motion. And uh, uh, also it would be good to um, discuss a little bit about this inertial system of references, how we can go from one inertial system of reference to another and which parameters are going to change and which remain the, the same. So let us consider an example of um, velocity vector and acceleration vector when we have such uh, a system of two inertial systems of reference. So let us describe this uh, system. Uh, we have um, first system of reference which is x y and we consider this inertial system of reference as stationary it doesn't move then let us add here uh, one more system of reference which will be x prime y prime so what is important about this system of reference that it moves with some um, velocity vector v naught with respect to a stationary system of reference x y. So x prime y prime moves with some uh, velocity vector uh, v naught. Let's say it's aligned along axis x uh, with respect to this uh, immobile um, system of reference. Okay, we defined with this uh, system, uh, inertial system of references. Now let us add here um, some object. Let's call it object A. And uh, in the scope of the mobile system of reference, x prime, y prime, it will possess some velocity vector v prime and some acceleration vector a prime so keep in mind that this is with respect to the mobile 
system of reference. Also, with respect to this mobile system of reference, x prime, y prime, we can define the position of this point, this point A, um, with radius or sorry, position vector r prime. So with respect to the mobile system of coordinates, with to the origin of this mobile system of coordinates. From other side, we can also define the position of the origin of this mobile system of coordinates with respect to immobile one. So this will be position vector R naught. Maybe let us write it from other side. R naught vector. So now we define position of the mobile system of reference with respect to the immobile. And obviously, we can define also the position of this point A with respect to a mobile system of reference. So that will be position vector R. So it's clear from this plot that position vector R is the sum of these two position vectors. So let us write it down. And we will have the expression for the position vector of point A with respect to uh, immobile system of coordinates given as the sum of R naught vector plus R prime vector. So now we know the definition of speed, like of velocity, and that is uh, first derivative of position uh, vector over time. So let us take this first derivative. It will be dr vector over dt equal to dr naught vector over dt plus dr prime vector over dt. So instead of this, we can already use velocity vectors. So we have v vector, v velocity vector defines the um, velocity of object A with respect to E mobile system of uh, like stationary system of reference. And then we have v naught vector, that is how fast this uh, mobile system of reference is moving with respect to stationary one plus v naught uh, v prime vector and that is um, the how fast object a is moving with respect to mobile system of reference so now we see that in order to go from stationary uh, inertial system of reference to some mobile inertial system of reference we change the parameter which is velocity vector because for one system of reference, we need to use V, and for another, uh, which is V naught plus V prime, and for another, it's just V prime. So these velocity vectors, which describe motion of object A in uh, with respect to uh, stationary and mobile system of references, they are different. And uh, uh, that means that velocity vector is a variant parameter means parameter which changes when we go from one inertial system of reference to another inertial system of reference, depending how they are moving with respect to each other. However, that's not true for such parameter as acceleration. So let us follow this trend. Uh, we know also how we define acceleration. It's first derivative of velocity vector over time. So let's write it down here. dv vector over dt is equal to dv naught vector over dt plus dv prime vector over dt. So here we need to recall that both of these system of references are inertial. And that means if one, this xy is stationary, the second 
can move, but it can move only with constant velocity vector v naught. Means it can move only um, with constant magnitude of this velocity vector and constant direction. So means along a straight line. In this case, it's along axis x. Um, if it's constant in both magnitude and direction, then derivative of this dv vec dv naught vector over time will be equal to zero because it doesn't change neither in magnitude nor in direction. So that means that we have dv vector over dt is equal to dv prime vector over dt. So from here we can um, write that acceleration vector which describes acceleration of um, this object A with respect to stationary system of coordinate x, y will be equal, it will be the same as acceleration vector A prime which describes motion of object A with respect to the mobile system of reference. That will be x prime, y prime. <clears throat> As you see, in this case, when we go from one system of reference, one inertial system of reference, to another inertial system of reference, acceleration vector remains constant. It doesn't change. And that's why it's called so-called invariant parameter. It doesn't change. So, <clears throat> highlighting these uh, features of uh, inertial system of co coordinates and uh, references and uh, uh, also um, how velocity vector and acceleration vector um, can be changed when we go from one inertial system to another, we can proceed further with um, the discussion of uh, laws of motion and introduce the second law of motion, which gives us the relationship between uh, force and acceleration. So how would you formulate the second law of motion? F equals F vector is equal to M times A vector. So let us write it down here. f vector equals to m times a vector where a uh, m is um, some parameter let's we will discuss this uh, also there is another way to express the second law of motion because you could consider it a bit to be more intuitive um, acceleration actually is the result of exerted force on the body so you could right acceleration vector is equal to force vector divided by m. <clears throat> so force is the vector quantity which uh, defines the impact on, on the body uh, from external environment and uh, uh, that impact tries to accelerate the Oh. So you see that this force is in numerate when we determine acceleration. So it means we have proportional dependence. The higher force, <clears throat> the higher acceleration. However, we have also in the denominator this parameter m, and that is the feature of the object which defines how much it resists to be accelerated. So uh, you can describe it as some level of laziness of an object to be uh, to follow this force which tries to accelerate it and resist of changing its current uh, velocity. So that is inertial mass. And here we need to highlight that there is a difference between inertial and gravitational mass. So technically, well, it happened that they are equal to each other, but they describe quite different physical natures because uh, inertial mass is a measure of inertness of the object and its resistance to change its velocity. Uh, however, gravitational mass describes how much 
this it describes the feature of the body how it interacts with the gravitational field so you can feel that these are quite different features uh, however they happen to be the same so but we need to be aware of uh, some key principles how to measure correctly uh, different parameters so we will discuss this uh, let us first uh, discuss acceleration so yeah well you can also consider that but it's, it's not resistant so it defines the force uh, so if you consider it in the scope of of uh, second law of motion so uh, there is a driving force and uh, uh, mass is kind of a parameter which is reversally proportional acceleration is reversally proportional to mass so the larger mass you can consider is like this parameter this feature which uh, describes the possibility of an object to resist of being accelerated in the case of gravitational uh, interaction you have this general gravitational equation which describes for instance force gravitational force between two bodies let's say we have earth and an object and then it gives us the force this equation gives us the force uh, defined as a product of the mass of the object multiplied by the uh, strength of the gravitational field and uh, that actually defines how much this uh, object interacts with gravitational field in terms of uh, this force so it doesn't have anything to do with acceleration so it really defines only the interaction between uh, object itself and gravitational force in around the surrounding uh, environment and uh, uh, so we, we can uh, really consider these masses from different very different physical points of view however their uh, magnitude uh, this uh, which describes the feature of the object they are equal both inertial and uh, gravitational mass so uh, how would you measure acceleration vector or just acceleration magnitude let's say you have some inclined plane and there is some ball or some block sliding down uh, through this inclined plane uh, what is the approach why well, should be quite intuitive approach we can uh, measure the rate of change of the velocity or momentum yeah we can deal with velocity so we need to pick up because how we uh, let's say we, we want to get some average acceleration for instance we need to pick up two moments of time uh, and give very narrow time intervals just around these moments of time within this narrow time interval we need to measure how much it traveled along this inclined plane for instance that will be delta x we divide by this small time interval delta t we get the velocity but that will be let's say v1 uh, velocity at moment of time one the same we do for moment of time two and eventually uh, we have uh, v2 minus v1 it's change of our velocity divided by t2 uh, minus t1 so acceleration we can express as v2 minus v1 divided by t2 minus t1 so that is quite straightforward and intuitive approach to measure acceleration which shows that we definitely can do it um, quite accurately of course technically it's not so easy as may seem to you but we can do it uh, also uh, there are devices which are designed to measure acceleration kind of directly uh, so called accelerometers and I believe most of your smartphones have embedded accelerometers 
already there. Any ideas how these accelerometers work? What is the principle of functioning of an accelerometer sensor in your smartphone? Huh? Uh, well, you can do it with uh, GPS, of course, but that will not be so accurate because uh, like positioning and time, uh, so you can derive acceleration from there. But since GPS is not so accurate, uh, positioning, so uh, the accuracy will be quite low. So you have a special device embedded in, in smartphone, uh, which measures acceleration. So actually you have three of them because you can measure acceleration along three different axes, so X, Y, Z. But if we consider just one, like general principle, so you can fix with some string a uh, block, like some small mass with known mass m. And next to it, there will be some so-called piezoelectric crystal, which uh, generates some potential difference at its edges. So we can measure with voltmeter some potential difference uh, at the edges of this piezoelectric crystal uh, as a function of force which compresses it or stretches it. So we, it can change polarity, depends on compression or stretching. So if we have such a crystal calibrated, so we what means calibrated? That we have this dependence force exerted on this crystal versus uh, bias. Uh, like potential uh, difference as, which is generated at the edges of this crystal. So then when this system starts to move in this direction, left and right, uh, there will be motion of this body with known uh, mass m. Since mass is known, um, and we also measure force with which this mass pushes on the piezoelectric crystal uh, because we know this force because we measure this voltage which is generated by piezoelectric crystal. Uh, we know force, we know mass and obviously we can just write the script to calculate in real time acceleration and uh, uh, report acceleration along this axis, let's say axis x. If you have three devices like this uh, aligned with right angles to each other, you can measure uh, acceleration with high accuracy in all three dimensions. So quite useful device. <coughs> so now let us consider this mass. How would we measure mass? Uh, sure, I mean, it has, uh, that's a unit, measure, but like technically, you have an object and you want to know uh -huh. the mass. Yes. Okay, yeah, but you need to know density, uh, so you don't, you have just an object and uh, you want to measure mass. You have an apple, how would you measure its mass? Weight. Uh, weights? Uh, scale, yeah. Like weight. Yes. Uh, that's a reasonable approach, and technically it will give you the correct magnitude, like the value will be correct. However, this experiment is not exactly what we need to do because weight, when we scale things, we measure weight, we measure this interaction with gravitational field of planet Earth. We neglect other objects. So planet Earth creates some gravitational field. We have strands of this gravitational field, which is G, which is acceleration of free fall. Then we have mass of the object, M times G vector, that defines weight uh, of this object. And uh, that's how we can measure, we compare different weights, and uh, uh, we measure uh, the mass, but that's gravitational mass. So that's how we measure uh, the level of interaction uh, of this object with gravitational field. However, if we want to determine exactly, be sure that we are measuring 
um, so-called inertial mass. Then we need to be sure that we do this experiment uh, in that way that we measure specifically uh, inertial mass, not gravitational mass. So the, the option how it could be done, um, it could be some imaginary experiment when we move a system of a string and a block <coughs> with known mass m somewhere in outer space. We neglect with all gravitational fields because this outer space is located so far from any uh, sources of gravitational fields, we can neglect with them. Then we exert certain arbitrary force on this block and uh, it starts to move with some acceleration. So we can measure this acceleration experimentally. So we know already how we measure acceleration. So acceleration vector, uh, well, let's probably better write in a different way. This force which exerted on the block will be equal to, uh, let's call it M naught, that we know this mass, so it's some calibrated mass, M naught. So it will be M naught uh, times um, A vector. So A vector we can measure, M naught we know, it's known mass, some calibrated block. Then when we did this experiment, we can have everything the same, means the string and the force which we exert, but change this block with known mass with a block which mass of which we don't know. So then we have the same conditions, but instead we have a different block with some mass m, which we don't know, but we want to determine it. We exert the same force on this block uh, and measure acceleration. So in this case, force F can be represented as unknown mass M times this acceleration A. Let's call this also acceleration A, A not to, to differentiate between them. So now we know that this force is the same. We didn't change conditions of the experiment. So we can write that M naught times A naught vector is equal to m times a vector. And from all these four parameters, the unknown is only this mass, because this one we know from the beginning, and acceleration vectors we measure. So obviously then we can determine the inertial mass of this unknown object that will be uh, m naught times a naught vector divided by a vector. So this is the approach how uh, you would um, specifically address the measurement of inertial mass, uh, which is included uh, in this uh, second law of motion. Okay, so with second law of motion more or less clear, Let's go to the third one. And uh, the third law of motion tells us that there is reaction. So if there is action, there is reaction. So if we have a body one, which exerts some force on body two, uh, that we call action, um, there will be some force exerted from body two on body one which we call reaction, this force will be equal in magnitude, but uh, different in direction. So that is the um, third law of motion. Let us maybe write this down to make it more uh, clear. So we have one force, uh, one object and second object, and there is some force F12, exerted from object one on object two, which is we call action. Then there is reaction from 
body 2 to body 1, F to 1, uh, which we call reaction. And now we can write that magnitudes of these vectors are the same. However, they are pointed in different directions, like opposite directions, not different. So F12 is equal to minus F21. So that's the definition of uh, second law of uh, motion. And uh, uh, we can consider some, some examples. Like, for instance, if we have a block placed on a horizontal surface, there will be some weight of this block, and that is mg vector. Let's consider that this is our x direction, uh, or x axis, and positive direction is upwards. Uh, so this is mass of this block m. Uh, let us additionally exert some force which goes from top to bottom on this block, this force F. And then there will be some reaction. We mark it with capital N of this uh, surface, uh, which uh, keeps this block in stationary position. So if we consider that this block doesn't move anywhere, we can write for direction of axis x. Uh, what is positive here? Positive here is reaction n, because it coincides with the positive direction of axis x. So we can write n minus uh, m times g, because this weight is directed downwards, opposite direction of axis x, and also minus f, this exerted force on top of the block. This should be uh, equal to zero because we have stationary condition and there is no any acceleration. If there is some acceleration, then we have in the right side of this equation uh, mass of the block uh, times uh, acceleration. But in this case, we consider some stationary condition. So another option to uh, be considered, make this example a little bit more interesting when we have inclined plane and uh, uh, there is some distribution of this weight uh, of the block, like weight vector of the uh, block on axis y and x. So when we have such an inclined plane, Here is some angle theta. This is our block. We will not consider any friction now. Friction we will consider a bit later. So this is the weight vector, mg vector. And since this plane is inclined, so we want to make our life easier in this case, we pick up on um, our system of coordinates in that way that we have axis x parallel to the inclined plane and axis y perpendicular to inclined plane. So now we can split this um, weight uh, of the block on two components. Let me change the color. So here we will have mg times cosinus theta. That will be component of weight along axis y. This component will be compensated by reaction of the plane. So this will be n. <clears throat> and also we have additional x component. So let me change another color, this one, this will be mg times sinus theta. 
So in this case, when we split this uh, weight vector of the block into two components along axis y and x, we can write the um, equations for each direction, uh, similar what we did uh, previously when we had only one direction. So for y direction, we can write that m g times cosinus theta is equal to, well, probably better to write like this, minus, ah, uh, exact. So it's, it's, in order to, we need to follow the positive direction of axis y. So in this case, it will be n minus mg times cosinus theta that is equal to zero because there is no motion along axis y it just slides on the surface of of this inclined um, surface along axis x so this condition uh, stationary condition and for axis um, x we can write that mg sinus theta is equal to m times a. So, uh, since we don't have any friction, there is nothing which counterbalance the um, x component of the weight, um, which is mg times sinus theta. And that's why it results in acceleration of this block uh, along uh, axis x. So if we change angle theta, for instance, uh, if we decrease angle theta to zero, then obviously this acceleration will also go to zero since um, there is no <coughs> x component of the weight. Yes. Now let's go with mg. Uh, mg. So that's what we. So this mg. Now if we add two vectors, like projection of uh, mg on axis y and x, we get this vector mg. So this is the weight of the motion. Mass times uh, g, a vector. Then we split it in two components. And keep in mind, so how we do it here also, that we have this angle theta here also. This uh, these two angles should be the same. So taking into account that we know this angle, because we know angle of the inclined plane, we can split this weight vector of the object into two components. This one is a uh, component along axis y. This one along axis x. Component of weight along axis y is compensated with reaction of the inclined plane. This reaction is always perpendicular to the surface of the inclined plane. And um, we don't have any motion of object in direction of y x. So that's why uh, here they are compensated. We have zero in the right side. However, if we consider axis x along the inclined plane, and there is nothing to compensate this fraction of weight uh, vector and uh, uh, this results uh, since we consider friction equal to zero uh, this results in acceleration but acceleration happens only along axis x so we have actually one force it's weight nothing else mg but then we kind of split it into components along system of coordinates which we picked up in order to make our life easier when we deal with this, because uh, we could have used system of coordinates, y coordinate and like x, uh, y axis and x axis, but then it would be way more difficult to deal with. So we want to align this system of coordinates in that way, which makes our calculations as simple as possible. Okay, guys, so with this, I think we can wrap up. Yes, no. of course, this one. Mm -hmm. So uh, we 
introduced the concepts of uh, three laws of motion. Uh, first law of motion tells us that in inertial system of coordinates, free or quasi free objects move with constant velocity or are stationary uh, and move with constant velocity along a straight line. There's no other option. Uh, second law of motion gives us the relationship between acceleration and exerted force on the object. And we introduce this concept, concept of inertial mass, which is the feature like property of the object to resist its change uh, of velocity. And uh, uh, consider how we could measure these parameters because this is quite important uh, to correctly measure uh, different physical parameters. There are even in every, most countries, there are national institutes of standards, uh, standardization, so they specify how different parameters should be measured correctly. So that is really important to know exactly what you're doing in order to uh, interpret your experimental results correctly. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, also the third law of motion, which um, tells us that every uh, action, if we have some action from body one and body two, there is reaction from body two and body one equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. So uh, also discuss some examples of this application of uh, uh, second and third law of motion on example of this inclined uh, plane. Uh, so with this, thank you very much for attention. Uh, we meet next time on uh, Wednesday. So Monday is the day off. I wish you happy Constitution Day. Um, enjoy your free time and gain more energy. Come back and we will continue.